Today's video is about eating like a yogi. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa West and welcome to Living Your Yoga. Before we get started today, two things about this video. Number one is that it's going to be a much longer Living Your Yoga video. So you might wanna save it until you have a little bit more time and you can sit back and relax and enjoy it. Number two, I ask that we can all be kind to each other with this video. So let's practice ahimsa, loving kindness, compassion, and nonviolence. So when you do choose to leave your comments below on this video, make sure that they, that they speak to yourself and your choices and that you don't pass judgment on other people and their choices. So those are my two requests for this video. Thank you. So here's today's question. Hello, Melissa. I notice very much how my diet changes with the seasons. I follow seasonal foods with vegetable boxes and what I harvest in my garden. But my instincts pick up different meats, dairy, and grains at different times of the year too. Are there different suggestions for doshas that the, as the year goes by, or should I follow my instinct? I particularly notice this autumn has bought lethargy, which might be exacerbated by life circumstances too but I've had this with a craving for red meats and leafy vegetables and insomnia some days, meaning that I'm wanting to be set in a more regimented routine during the day and try to rectify this. I've had blood tests to check for iron deficiency and other issues and already take vitamin D supplements, but, already, but always notice the lethargy to some extent most years at this time. So I wonder if there's a book that I could turn to that I might follow throughout the year or if you might have some resources to follow here as well as the winter series that might help. So thank you for a great question. This brought up a huge and lively discussion on our membership forum. And so I decided to address it in a lengthy way. And I have been thinking about doing a, what it means to eat like a yogi course for a long time. And it looks like I will be doing that because there's a lot of interest in it. I'd love to hear from you if you'd be interested in something like that too. After this video, leave that in the comments below. So here are my thoughts on this based on the interest in this. I think the most important thing that we can remember here is to take our yoga off the mat when it comes to eating like we do with many things in our lives. So the question becomes, how can I take the principles of the way that I practice my yoga to eating? And some of the most key and salient points that I think that bear repeating the, the ways that we practice yoga are three. Here are the three things that I think we need to remember. You are your own best teacher, so you know what's best for you. Number two, listen to your body and respond appropriately. And number three, there is no better or best, so do what's right for your body at this moment. And that's always changing. So from here, I think we can remember the principles of yoga. And for that, we can refer to the eight limbs of yoga. And we did a whole series on that, and I'm gonna to refer to that in our show notes. Remember the eight limbs of yoga simply allow us to remove what is unnecessary so that the wisdom that already resides within us can come to the surface. The first limbs of yoga are the yams. The yams prepare us for the, our intent for action in thought, word, and deed. Intent for action is incredibly important as we prepare for eating. It allows us to see clearly the choices that we are making for ourselves and how they impact all living beings in the world in which we live. The first yam is the hinsa, non-harming. A yogi's action should not bring harm to any living being but you are also a living being, so that has to include yourself as well. Many yogis interpret this to mean that a living a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, and that is a beautiful and loving and kind way to live. I myself lived that way for more than a decade. However, due to extreme illness, I had to get clear about the violence that was being inflicted on my body and make ch choices that were better for me. So see, there has to be some detachment. No better, best. What is right for you in the moment? And that can change. Being detached from any one way of eating, I was able to make better choices for my body and ultimately be of better service to the world overall. The second yam is truthfulness, satya. 
This is about being honest with ourselves about how our food choices are affecting us in our bodies. Right now, we are buying this delicious gluten-free pancake mix from Origins, an amazing bakery here in Victoria. We love it. <laughs> it's spongy and delicious, and Tim and Trinity love it too. However, if I'm honest with myself, every time I eat them, I notice that my energy gets depleted. <laughs> this is one example of being honest about how my food affects my body. It's also an example of being detached from the way I'm eating. Just because it's gluten-free doesn't mean that it's good for me. It doesn't mean it's health food. <laughs> so the third yum is aseya, non-stealing. To me, this is about, it's um, important that I th think about this in terms of the way that I'm eating, especially in terms of animal. How can I make the most ethical decisions if I'm going to eat animals and animal byproducts? Then thinking about non-stealing. The fourth yum is brahmacharya, which refers to non-productive expenditures of energy. This goes back to my pancake example. It takes more energy for my body to digest those pancakes than I receive from eating them. So on the other hand, when I take my teaspoon of fish oil each morning, my brain literally does a happy dance. So pay attention to the way that your food affects your overall energy. So is your food giving your energy or is it taking energy away from you? The fifth yum is a parigraha, non-hoarding. It's important, it's an important one in our culture uh, and our culture is one of plenty. So it takes an incredible amount of mindfulness to pay attention to the cues of our body. Often we will eat when we're not hungry because something is available and continue eating when we are full because it tastes good. It takes a lot of energy for our body to digest food when it doesn't need it or when we're already full. So being aware of the cues of our body is paramount. Then we move into the niyams, the personal observances. And these give us even more clues about how to eat as a yogi. The first niyam is sauch. And this is a great one when we think about eating like a yogi. Sauch means cleanliness. To eat foods in their most natural form is a great way to practice sauch. In our cultural convenience, it's easy to get sidetracked from this one with food that's prepackaged and prepared. The second niyam is santosh, santosh contentment. And this is a fabulous observance of as the yogi around food. If when we eat, we can focus simply on eating and the pleasure of food, uh, then we're practicing contentment much more. So for example, if when you're eating, you're always distracting yourself by doing something else like um, reading a book or doing social media or watching TV, then you're not really in the uh, contentment or the pleasure of eating your food, you're in the pleasure of something else. The third niyam, tapas, discipline definitely has its place when it comes to eating like a yogi. It takes discipline and time and energy to prepare your food. So again, this goes back to the cultural convenience that we live in. We kind of expect everything to happen all at once and easily, and it takes time to prepare food from scratch, and it's a discipline. And there's there's no way around that and that's all there is to it. So the rewards of carving out the time to prepare your food are huge and I highly recommend it. The fourth niyam, svadhyaya, self-study. This is what I was speaking about at the beginning with the core principles. Nobody knows you as well as you. You are your own best teacher and you know what's best for you. Study your relationship to food. Don't take advice from experts is truth. Become the scientist in your own body and see if it's true for you. So even when you read a book from somebody else, test it out in your own body. See if it works for you. See if it doesn't work for you. You know. Self-study. When you practice all of these things in relation to your eating, you will experience the fifth niyam, Ishvara Pranidhana. This is uh, closer to the union with the divine within and all around you. The third limb of yoga is asan. Ask yourself, how is what I'm eating affecting my yoga practice? Am I experiencing more ease and steadiness in my postures based on what, am I, what I'm eating or am I more unsteady in my postures? 
Some examples are stimulants such as caffeine and sugar might take away from ease and steadiness in your postures. You know, some things might some foods might make you more grounded and then it's easier to practice your yoga. So check it, check this out again in your own body. The fourth limb of yoga is pranayama. Ask yourself, how is what I'm eating affecting my breath? One thing that has been working for me in my diet is to be increasing my fats a lot. So one thing that I played with is eating some cheese. We've got some great farms here in Victoria that um, treat their animals ethically. And so um, we tried some cheese from Paradise Farms and Avalon Farms. And what I found was this doesn't work at all for me. Cheese created mucus linings in my nose that made it hard for my, me to breathe. So my meditation practice, my pranayama practice really suffered. So I have to like cut that out again so that's what I'm talking about about um, being your own scientist knowing your body best checking things out in your own body so doing what works best for you and see how all of these overlap and intertwine too everything's connected the fifth limb of yoga is pratyahar this is yoga teaches us to appreciate using our five senses for example, if we relied solely on our sense of taste to eat, this would be a huge mistake because our taste buds are insatiable. We would just keep eating and eating and eating because our mouth taste, our mouth hunger is just wants more and more and more. If I had a piece of chocolate, I would just want more and more and more chocolate. My, my mouth would never be satisfied. We have a lot more of this on, in our mindful eating course in, on our membership site. Pratyahar teaches us to be aware of our senses and to control them um, in our, our eating. And this, this again, interweaves with tapas in discipline. So they, they come together. That's one example of it. You know, we could think about how we can, when we are mindful of our eating and we sit down to eat and practice contentment, we can put our food down and set our table nicely so that it's beautiful for us to look at too. The sixth limb of yoga is dharan, gentle contemplation. When we're focused on what we're doing in a gentle and kind way, we can know how it affects us. Bringing this level of gentleness and mindfulness to eating is a gift. The seventh limb of yoga is dhyan, continuous meditation. So this level of mindfulness around eating is not something we do once and forget about it. It's like brushing our teeth is something we can do every single time that we eat. Our eating can be a space of continuous meditation and gentle contemplation. The final limb of yoga is samadhi, bliss. When we bring all of these tools of awareness that we have as yogis through the eight limbs of yoga to food, we can improve our relationship to food. So in addition to the eight limbs of yoga, I feel it is important to point out two key tools on the spiritual path, detachment and discernment. The diet industry is a $60.5 billion industry in the U.S. alone in 2014. Writing a book or a method with instructions on how to eat is big money with big profits. So remember that people are making money every single time they set out a plan that tells you how to eat. This is not to say that there isn't valuable information out there, but go back to the first three points that I've mentioned and probably several of the points that we've gone over in this blog post. Number one, you are your own best teacher. You know what's best for you. Number two, listen to your body and respond appropriately. Number three, there is no better or best. Do what's right for your body in this moment. Secondly, it can become easy to get attached to our identity, even in terms of the way that we eat, or perhaps even especially in terms of the way that we eat. Tim and I know this firsthand. We've gone through this. For example, I am vegan. I am gluten-free. I am sugar-free. I am paleo. I am a juicer. I only drink green smoothies in the morning. These become badges of honor that we wear around like our identity. I have learned that it is important to be detached from isms and labels. This allows you to be open to what is actually happening in your body moment to moment and respond appropriately. That is detachment. I know this has been a long post, but two more things. <laughs> Number one, 
Linda Doubledam and I are hosting a webinar on eating seasonally in the fall that will be bringing these principles of eating mindfully in the seasons to life this Wednesday, December the 3rd at noon Pacific Standard Time. And we would love to have you with us. It's an exclusive webinar exclusive for members. So by the time you see this blog post, it will be tomorrow. We will have a recording for this uh, that will be housed on the membership site forever if you miss it <laughs> because you haven't seen this in time. Secondly, I know this is a lot to absorb. The tools are here, but perhaps it would be useful for uh, Namaste yogis and members to be taken through this process in a 10 to 12 week online course with yoga classes, meditations, an online forum and weekly meetups. So I've been thinking a lot about putting together a course like this for some time, something like eating like a yogi. So let me know in the comments or respond to me, send me an email at info at melissawest.com and let me know if that is something that interests you. So this was a, bit, a really super long blog post and I thank you for hanging out to the end if you did. <laughs> like this video if you liked it. Subscribe to our channel, send it to a friend if you think it would be helpful to them and leave your comments below. Remember, let's be kind to each other with this one. Thanks so much for watching. Melissa would love to hear your questions and thoughts. Please leave your comments below the video. Thank you for your reviews on iTunes and YouTube. Your reviews help us to share yoga and a yoga lifestyle with others around the world. If you have a question for Melissa, you can leave a voice message at melissawest.com and Melissa may answer it in an upcoming blog.